What's going on, beautiful people? Welcome here. Please smash that beautiful like button on your way in. And if you're brand new to my work, I want to give you a special welcome here as well. Today's video, as you can see, we're not going to do any slides. It's just you and me. We're just going to sit back. I'm going to share with you a story. And that basically that story is why and how I came to embrace the carnivore diet. And so I'm calling this video coming out as carnivore. Let's get right into it. First and foremost, I wanted to share with you why I'm doing this, why I'm sharing this, creating this video and sharing this experience with you. And it's actually very simple because I want to help you. I want to help you and people like you who have been suffering in their own way. They've been struggling and trying to figure this all out and I want to share my personal experience as a testimonial and add my voice to others who have done the same thing as a way to encourage you. Because I know this is not going to necessarily apply to every single person, but I also know from interacting with people every day that a lot of people are struggling and a lot of people don't understand why and how their nutrition or the way they're eating or the lack thereof is actually, they're actually harming themselves. So if for no other reason than to help you end your suffering and to embrace a higher standard of living, a higher quality of life for yourself, that's really my main motivation for doing this. I, I feel like I have a moral duty to speak up and not just keep quiet. I also wanted to clarify that I am not here to prove anything to you. I'm not here to prove anything, nor am I here to try to get you to do anything. I'm simply going to share my perspective and what I've come to understand about the nutrition sciences and about the proper human diet and how it relates to both health on the one side and chronic disease and illness on the other side. But it's just me sharing my perspective. This is one perspective. I'm going to invite you to not believe anything I say, just, just as I always tell you, and rather go do your own research. Go test this out for yourself. Put it to the test for yourself and you decide. Ultimately, it's your choice. If you decide not to embrace this, that's totally cool. I respect your free will decision to do that. So I'm not here to prove anything. I'm simply here to share what I know to be true from my own experience in the hopes that it can help you if if it is able to and if if you are receptive to that and if you can benefit from it also i'm completely aware that this is going to be considered controversial that this is essentially controversial and there's going to be people pitted against each other with opposing perspectives so i totally get that i'm totally cool with that i've always been comfortable speaking about topics that are controversial provided that i know where i stand on those topics so that's okay. And if you if we're if there's some polarity, if there's some opposition, then that's fine. This is this is the nature of reality. People are going to take opposing sides. And I don't think anyone should ever shy away from speaking what they know is true just because someone else is going to oppose that. So my perspective is I'm fine with that. I don't really care. I do know what I know and I, I'm going to share it as I know it. Um, and if there's controversy, so be it. I actually, actually, I welcome it because that is where the growth happens. So the first important question worth considering here, of course, is how did this come about? How did this happen? And why, why did I specifically seek out a solution in terms of nutrition for healing myself? How, how did this all come about? And in order to understand that, I'm going to share a little bit of context without diving in too deep and without being too long-winded. I'm just going to share with you a little bit of the background of what led me to follow this path. Now, as you know, we're not all born perfect. M many of us, many people are born with some kind of birth defect or some kind of health problem or challenge that doesn't necessarily have to even ruin or challenge them through the entirety of their lives, but it can in some cases, and in, that can also occur to varying degrees. Now, I have what is arguably a fairly mild 
birth defect or congenital birth defect. And the simplest way to explain it is that when I was born or perhaps perhaps before I was born or in the process of being born, I'm not sure which, I have a defect where the lumbar spine and the sacral vertebrae, the lumbar and sacral vertebrae are fused together where normally there would be an intervertebral disc between them to allow a certain range of motion, right? And a certain flexibility. So I don't know the reason why this happened. And to, to, to a large extent, it's kind of irrelevant to even understand that, although maybe not entirely. But the point is, it's all in the past. That's not something I can control or change. I can just become aware of it. Having this birth defect has had an impact on my entire life. Now, as you can see, it hasn't stopped me from functioning in life and moving forward, but it has had an impact and I haven't really talked a lot about it. But even when as I was, even in my early life, like as a child and, and beyond that, I was somewhat aware of it and I could see some of the effects of it. It's just, I didn't really seek to understand it. And I'll explain that a little more as well. So I'll just give a few examples. When I was young, maybe seven, eight, nine years old, I became aware and in my parents as well, those around me, that when I would walk around, I would actually walk on my toes. And although I didn't fully understand at the time, this was partly due to the pulling of, of the fascia around this part in my body and the tightness, which basically basically my whole back was very tight compared to what would normally be the case. And so this was pulling on the mus musculature all the way down to my feet. And so as a kid, I just naturally found myself walking on my toes. I didn't even really think about it. Another example, I was not able as a kid. So in, as children, we, when we're in elementary school, we start taking physical education. At least that was the case when I was in school. And uh, we do a lot of stretching and exercises and fitness. And I noticed very early on that I was very inflexible and I could, could not touch my toes. I could not touch my toes with my fingers with my knees straight. In other words, for flexibility, kids would touch their toes, but they'd kind of keep their legs straight. I was never at any point in my life able to do that, even up to the present day. And that was true no matter how, many, how much stretching, no matter how much physical therapy or massage or self-stretching or, or yoga or any type of practice I would do, it was all irrelevant. I was never and have ne to this day, I've never been able to touch my toes with my legs straight and my knees locked. And again, you might say, well, that's not a big deal. And yes, to a certain extent, it's not a big deal, but I'm just painting the picture for you, right? That this is, this is basically what is going on because normally in the human body, you would be able to do that. Now, if that tightness and lack of flexibility were kind of all there was to this, then it probably wouldn't be much of a big deal at all and it may not even require much more thought. However, that was not the case. In addition to having that inflexibility, I also experienced over the years a lot of tightness and discomfort in my entire iliosacral or pelvic region. And this had other physiological implications, including, for example, difficulty urinating, um, experiencing just different problems, and generally just affecting my mood because the tightness, particularly when I was trying to go to sleep, that was a big part of it. There was a lot of discomfort. And as you can imagine, when you're going to sleep, the most important thing is your body needs to be very relaxed so that you can just let go, let your body fully relax. And that that's part of, that's the major part of what allows us to go to sleep comfortably. So just imagine that I'm struggling with that even as a young child and what the implication is on my ability to get a good night's sleep and, and therefore to even function in life. Now this, this discomfort and pain and, and uh, tightness wasn't always the same through my whole life, but it's, 
it's kind of it's been there with me my whole life and it, there have been times when it's been more challenging and times when it's been less challenging and i'm going to explain in a minute why because the short answer is for a large part of my life i basically masked some of this by through self-medicating and again i'll explain a little more about that in a second but it's just to point out that to one degree or another this has been with me my whole life and at the very least i've i've had to be aware of it and i've had to at, at the very least manage it and see what i could do to to improve my health and my and my and to reduce inflammation so i actually have a chance to function in life so this has always been with me it's not something that was just with me in early childhood or just when i was an adult or just more recently it's kind of always been there it's just over the years it's become a challenge in different ways and at different times. Now, those of you who follow my story may know this already, but I think for this this may be brand new information for you is for about 12 years I self-medicated. And the way that that all came about was literally this pain and discomfort was driving me crazy. I was always in discomfort I was not sleeping well, so it was kind of like a vicious cycle. And as I'm going to explain in shortly, I was also had terrible, terrible eating habits and general, you know, nutritional hygiene, and which is which was definitely a factor that was contributing to it. I'm going to explain more about that part in a second, but because of all this, everything that was going on, um, I got to a point where literally I was going crazy, and I just concluded that I was anxious as a person just you know by nature that it, that it was basically a defect that I was anxious and not really understanding that I was basically contributing to that through the way I was eating and the way I was dealing with my health and my situation long story short in 1998 when I I was already working professionally and I just you know I I couldn't deal with the constant anxiety it was causing it was basically making it almost impossible for me to function at work much less in life so i convinced myself uh, through the help of some of those amazing people i'm being facetious of course those amazing people are here to help us as humanity haha ha. not really um the psychiatrists who uh who basically suggested, well, David, why don't you just take this wonderful medication called clonazepam? And clonazepam is in the same family as Valium, which most people will know, the sedative Valium. And it's a family of drugs called benzodiazepines. And it's basically just, it, it operates on a certain neuroreceptor in the, the brain, in the nervous system. And it just brings down the activity of the of the whole nervous system. It just has, it's a general damper, and so it just it calms the person down. So for twelve years, I was taking clonazepam until I finally weaned myself off of it, realizing that it, it was serving me no good and it was actually uh, destroying my mental health and my and my phys physical health, and it was just masking what was actually going on. Um, and during that time, it did have the effect of reducing my experience of pain. So, you know, I kind of had this false sense of being healed, but it was no, nothing of the kind. I was not healed at all. It was simply masking what was going on. Now, to make matters worse, if, if all this wasn't challenging enough, when I was a kid starting around that same time, you know, six, seven, eight years old, I developed a fierce addiction to sugar and carbs in general to sweets i'm talking fierce let me just share a couple of anecdotes i remember as a kid probably right around preteen, so right around the age of eight nine ten moving into my early teens so i was living in in central florida on the east coast at the time and there was this strip mall you know the strip malls from back from the 70s and 80s I think that was probably probably from the 60s actually they started becoming popular and right next to right between the junior high school and the beach was a giant strip mall 
And in that strip mall was a candy store. So you probably remember, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure we still have them today, but even back then we had these candy stores. And literally you go into this store and it was nothing but pure sugar, just packaged in different ways. All these do, different beautiful ways to package sugar with chocolate, without sugar, chocolate, gummy bears, you know, chewy drops, hard candies, lollipops, you name it. Like a, a paradise for the sugar addict. And the funny thing was, I don't know if it's funny, but the thing was that I, I would go into that store with no parental supervision. And they didn't care. Nobody cared that a young kid would come in without his parents. And I would just go to town and buy myself a lot of candy. And part of the reason why had to do with the suffering, the physio physiological suffering, but also part of it had to do with all the dynamics of what was going on in my life at the time. And I was generally suffer suffering and struggling and pretty miserable and doing a good job of hiding it. And this sugar addiction was almost certainly one of my ways to cope with it. But the problem is once I got that addiction, once I got hooked on that drug, and it is a drug, it's absolutely a drug, then uh, it was a habit that I realized or I came to see that I was going to have pretty much through my whole life, even up until recently. And one other quick anecdote, my addiction was so bad and my oral hygiene was so bad with respect to that, that several of my baby teeth, they didn't fall out, they crumbled, they literally disintegrated. And I'm not making that up, I'm, I'm being completely straight with you. They literally, like the molar would just come crashing apart instead of popping out. And uh, my, my oral hygiene was a mess, an absolute mess. Now, if you've been paying attention and if you understand these dynamics to any degree, you probably picked up on the fact that there was something deeper going on. And what I've come to realize looking back was that the deeper causal factor to all this, to me, stuffing my face with sugar, sugar and carbs, not just as a kid, but through my whole life and not really trying to get to the bottom of these health challenges and understand, first of all, what's the nature of them and how can I deal with them properly? How can I set myself up for the best health? There has to be some kind of underlying psychology behind that. And sure enough, what I've been able to realize is that as a young child and for a large part of my life, I didn't really truly love and respect myself. And the dynamics with which I was came into the world and in which I grew up simply reinforced that. So there was no strong nurturing component to help me gain that self-love, self-confidence to stand up for myself, not just against other outside threats, but even to just be good with myself within my own self, within my own mind and body. So I didn't really stand up for myself internally as well as externally. And that's what allowed me to basically abuse my health through these addictions and just give myself temporary pleasure. But as you know, temporary pleasure is not ever going to be a substitute for true self-love and self-respect, which leads to self-control and making better choices. So I was making all these poor choices because I just didn't care enough about myself to make better choices. Now, to put this further in context, I just want to be honest with you and say that even up until just a few years ago, this struggle with addiction to sugar was still a thing. And together with it, the struggle to get a good night's sleep, to reduce chronic pain and inflammation. But it wasn't entirely for lack of trying. So, for example, I did start to care more and I did start to take action on removing addictions from my life and taking better care of myself. So, so I wasn't, you know, up to a certain point, yes, I was really basically abusing my, my body and my physiology, but at some point I started to take back control. And it all started in 2008, 2009, when I was a good 
10 years into my addiction to clonazepam when I basically made the decision that enough is enough. And I said, I need to get myself off of this drug and I'm going to do whatever it takes. I was re resolved. I had the resolve and the determination to do that. And I started myself on a very good path of doing that. And it took a few years, but the last time I ever took clonazepam or any type of drug like that was basically 13 years ago. So now I've not, I've been sober from those drugs longer than I was on them. So, so that's a great accomplishment. Um, I also, over the subsequent years, started to tackle other addictions. I recognized that I had an addiction to pornography, which is kind of hard to admit, and I went to town on that. I realized that I had, I had become addicted to smoking cigarettes from all the stress, and that kind of overlapped with when I was on these drugs, and I was able to about eight years ago, seven, eight years ago, I was able to completely wean myself off of that. And so I, I was finding success in tackling these different addictions, but I still had and st still had this one addiction that was probably, maybe you could even argue, as bad as, if not worse than all the others, and that was the addiction to sugar and carbohydrates. And I just hadn't put all the pieces together in my mind that this was how much of an effect this was continuing to have on me. Uh, but it wasn't going to be long until I figured that out because coincidentally, or not coincidentally, I would say synchronistically, in early 2020, right around the, the time that the entire world experienced a, an episode of mass psychosis and mass disassociation from, the, from how reality actually works on a massive you know, worldwide scale, as you and I both know, I also had a deepening of my suffering at that time because I started to get to a point where the chronic pain that I was experiencing in my lower back and in my pelvic region was so debilitating that I, I literally couldn't get, a, get out of bed half of the time. And even if I could, my energy was so low from having slept so poorly that roughly half of the days, I didn't even have the mental capacity to go about doing, and I had no desire. Like It was like I was another person half of the time. And when I did get sleep, which fortunately would happen, I, it's like I woke up a whole new person and I was ready to take on the world. But it's kind of like that maybe Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde or having two different personalities. Like the times that I wouldn't sleep well, it just, the motivation was completely gone. And like I said, it was all synchronistically coming to a head right around the same time that the entire world was being challenged to wake up as well. Now, interestingly enough, starting around, I guess within the last decade, give or take, maybe within the last 10 to 15 years, as, as my awareness of of my increasing awareness of self-responsibility for healing myself and grew and also my awareness of the impact of health and nutrition in other words the way we eat on health grew i started to explore and try to figure out how to address this i i became aware that that inflammation was the issue chronic inflammation and i started to seek out solutions and interestingly enough, kind of the, the first pass at that for me was to gravitate towards, first towards vegetarianism, which I embraced starting around, I guess around 10 years ago, give or take, 10 to 11 years ago. And then that kind of bled into veganism, which I never embraced veganism for more than a small period of time. I don't think I ever went even a year as a vegan, and I'm going to explain in a minute why. But I was on that trajectory, and I was embracing it. And in my mind, I was embracing it for two main reasons. I was embracing it because it was going to, I believed it was going to give me better health and less inflammation and just a better quality of life. And I also believed that I was doing the right thing because I felt, well, if I'm not eating animals, I'm causing less harm in the world, 
and it's it's good all around so it's it's a double positive that's kind of how i looked at it and boy was i wrong about all of it i this is what i realized of course looking back hindsight is 2020 but i was actually moving in a direction to cause myself more harm i was leaning into what was harming me but i didn't understand any of that at the time because i just didn't have access to good information and the little information that i came across whether it was in the form of books or videos that i watched online or whatever materials it was either inaccurate or incorrect or in some cases it was out, it was complete it was deceptive meaning it was intentionally misinformation so i was not getting the right picture and as, as the more I leaned into vegetarianism and ultimately veganism, the more I suffered and the worse everything got. And it literally, it was almost like doubling down on my pain and suffering. But again, I could really only understand that after I reached a certain crisis point that I'm going to talk about in a minute. And it was kind of like it all came to a head and I, I was kind of faced with the reality of the circumstances that I had ultimately created for myself. So now I'm going to share with you the last straw, the straw that broke the camel's back, the situation that had happened to me that finally woke me up that I was on the wrong path. So about a year ago, as I continued to be bedridden, bedridden, practically bedridden half the time and very low energy about half the time, and I was leaning hard into veganism again. For like the second or third time i was you know despite all this suffering and i you know i can think back to times when i leaned hard into into veganism and plant-based eating and and like my pain would just double down and i was just thinking oh i just have to get through it i just have to get through it and it was just getting worse but i still leaned into it but this was finally the last straw so what happened was i became so weak that I went in the night, I went at night to, to have a pee, got up, you know, early morning hours. And when I was in the bathroom, I, I basically passed out. And I passed out and my, I, I completely blanked out. So I don't even remember this happening. I just remember after waking up, my head, the back of my head hit the wall, the concrete wall, pretty hard. And it hit it so hard that when I did wake up, and I think somebody found me, um, I had had a concussion and I could feel it and I could barely walk. Everything was spinning, like it was all spinning around and I had this throbbing headache. And for, and I had a proper concussion. I felt like a complete dumbass because I realized in that moment that I had done this to myself. Like it was just obvious to me. I can't explain to you why and how I knew that intuitively, but I just knew that this was all like my own doing. Like it was completely unnecessary. And the people around me were probably thinking like, you know, what the fuck? How does this happen? Because there's nothing wrong with my health other than that. And uh, other than that, I should have been fine. So needless to say, I, I had some bed rest and you know, the room continued spinning for a while until it finally, you know, the body does heal. And I did some research, some intense research on that during that time. And somehow, miraculously, there's a saying, when the student is ready, the teaching will appear. And somehow, miraculously, as I was doing this intense research, okay, healing from concussion, anti-inflammatory diet, the optimal diet for human health for long-term health and longevity some types of searches like that somehow it all came it all showed up the ketogenic diet and the carnivore diet and i was like i just had this moment of like this moment of aha uh -huh, like oh wow like almost like holy shit why didn't i even think of that why didn't it even occur to me and it was just the I can't even explain the feelings that I had at that moment it's like I'm not sure if this is going to work but I am I'll be damned if I'm not going to give it a try 
I'll be damned if I'm not going to at least give it a try. Now, my research led me to the work of several, I would say, public figures in the sense that they are what you could call influencers. They are people who are very visible on social media, particularly on YouTube. And they themselves, having strong credentials and having done a lot of research and even presenting their research publicly, they really helped me to understand the science of the, the causal science behind why I should even consider eating either a ketogenic or a carnivore diet and why this was the natural human diet and the diet that would lead to optimal health in terms of not just getting all the nutrients that we need, but in terms of reducing inflammation and reducing or eliminating even the, the chance for chronic illness and disease to, to start, much less to persist. So I want to mention three of these influencers who've had probably the greatest impact on me because if you are someone who's going to do some research on your own, and I obviously encourage you to do that, like I said at the beginning, I don't want you to just believe me or just accept what I'm saying. I want you to do your own research. You should do your own research. That's the right way to learn. But I want to at least give honorable mention to three of the influencers who have had the most impact on me and whose work has most helped me in this path. I want to thank Dr. Anthony Chafee. He is an American neurosurgeon and former rugby player who now lives in Perth, Australia and practices neurosurgery there, but also continues to create every week new content on YouTube. He's got a very large following there where he teaches people about what he calls plant-free living, which is basically his take on the carnivore diet. And he cites a lot of research and also the research that kind of opened his eyes to it as well as his own personal experience and that of the patients and that he consults with and people he consults with to help them with their own cases. So I highly encourage you to go check out Dr. Chafee's work. He's done amazing work. Um, he's very well spoken, very thorough in his research and explains everything very well. I don't necessarily agree with everything that he says and I may not necessarily share his exact worldview on everything, but his research and presentation of this material is solid. The next person I want to thank is Dr. Ken Berry, who is a family medical practitioner, an MD, based in Tennessee, who ha himself was able to heal his own uh, pre-diabetes and obesity. And he himself came to discover a number of years ago this, this same way of eating and has embraced that lifestyle. And now as part of his practice, he now, he and his wife, basically, I believe she is a nutritionist, if I'm not mistaken, but they, uh, they oh, she may be either a nutritionist or a, a physiologist or both, but they together create a lot of content where they're teaching people how this all works as well. So you're definitely gonna wanna check out Dr. Ken Berry's work. And then the third person who's given me a lot of credibility, he's, he's a bit more of a character. I get a lot of, I get a lot of humor out of him. Uh, out of watching his videos because he tend he likes to tear people apart when they're full of shit something that i love i really appreciate there's a place for that professor bart k who uh, i believe he's originally from new zealand and uh, he he is a uh, professor in uh, physiology and has also studied nutritional sciences so he's not an md unlike the other two uh, but he has many years of experience working on research and studying these, these topics. And uh, he's got some great material where he looks at the science of human nutrition, as well as other things, not just nutrition, but other things that I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some of them as well, about how to create healing. And so I really appreciate, like I said, the humor of how he just basically tears apart the charlatans and the fakes but also provides very sound and clear understanding of the science from a layman's terms. So it makes it easier to understand why this even, you know, why this is the way that we as human beings are meant to eat as a species genetically. So I wanted to mention those three and just kind of leave it to you. I'll have some links to their YouTube channels or their content in the description, but I want to encourage you again to go do your own research. 
these I, all I can tell you is when I started to come across their materials and those of others, it made it a lot easier for me to figure out how I was going to approach these changes and and also to give me the motivation to to keep forward, even though any kind of change is always going to be uncomfortable because I knew that if I persisted, I was going to get better results. And that essentially is what has happened. Now, through studying the materials that these three fine gentlemen have published and all the people who all the other researchers on whose backs their work is supported, I came to have a whole new understanding of my physiology as a human being and kind of the nature of, of what I could do to optimize my health and also a retrospective nature understanding of why and how I had harmed myself so much by not embracing the correct understanding of my own physiology. So this was a real awakener and kind of a real aha moment and I had to admit that at least in terms of healing and nutrition I had gotten it completely wrong. I was completely 180 degrees wrong. So there were a couple of things that came to light. And the first thing that I realized is that as human beings, physiologically, we are apex predators. We are obligate hyper carnivores. The proper human diet is and has been for probably millions of years, if you count like human beings as we are now and perhaps our immediate ancestors, going back millions of years, we've always been carnivores. That has been the only way that we can obtain all of the essential nutrition that we need while eliminating to the maximum extent possible all of the harmful substances which can hurt us and, and lead to disease. Now it is true that as human beings we have in our, in our bodies the ability to to convert both fats and glucose into energy, into ATP in our cells, in the mitochondria. It is true that we have both of those mechanisms. Yes. So as human beings, can we eat fruits and vegetables? Can we get away with eating certain plants that aren't too toxic? Of course, we can. And probably as long as we keep that input to a very low level, we're going to be okay. And probably that's actually a good thing because in the past, when we would actually have to hunt to survive, if there was ever a time when we just literally couldn't find, you know, we weren't successful hunting, then we could fall back temporarily on getting a, some energy from fruits and berries, from nuts, things like that. I mean, yes, we could survive on that, but that didn't mean that that was our optimal nutrition. That didn't mean that that's really what we were meant to eat. It just meant that we could fall back on that. But there was always a consequence. And as we'll talk about in a bit, there are serious consequences to even more than a small amount of glucose in the body, in the blood sugar and in the cell, in this intercellular fluid. So I'm not going to get too deep into the science, but all of that to say is that we are meant to eat meat. We're meant to be carnivores and we can fall back secondarily on eating some plant foods and some carbohydrates if necessary. Just to deepen our understanding on that last point a little bit. So the reason why we are obligate hyper carnivores is that eating meats and the associated fats of large ruminant animals, in other words, animals like cows, like cattle, but also perhaps sheep, for example, bison and so forth. Things that maybe we eat less of today, but they are appropriate for our diet. These are the only food sources that give us as human beings all the spectrum of nutrients that we need without supplementation. And anyone who is on a strict vegan diet, for example, who is not, who claims that they don't have to take any supplements at all, they're lying. They're either lying or they're on the quick path to, to self destruction because you cannot we cannot get all the nutrients we need as human beings from any other naturally occurring food source other than meat it's just it's physiologically impossible unless again unless we're supplementing okay so it's really really important to understand that 
And when I when I grasp that and 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 there's a reason why, if we're being honest with each other, there's a reason why we love the taste of a delicious, juicy steak. There's a reason why we love the taste of lamb chops, because these fatty, juicy meats are the exact optimal nutrition that we need. So our, our brains, our physiology is is sending us a reward signal saying, yes, keep eating that. You're getting, you're getting all the important nutrients. You're literally nourishing your body in the best way. So feel good about that. You go, keep doing that. So I don't know about you, but I love the taste of a good ribeye steak, for example. A, a juicy, fatty ribeye is one of my favorite foods to eat now. Now, as I started to go down this rabbit hole, if you want to call it that, of research around the carnivore diet and how to optimize health and nutrition, of course, I started getting exposed to some of the lies and deceptions that have been around for decades in some cases that have ultimately led to the absolute epidemic in obesity, in poor health, and illness. And to underline this, now, again, those of you who have been following my work, you know that I've done a lot of research and I've been able to lift the veils, you know, pull back the veils, and I can see how much lies and deception the modern civilization is based on. And so when it comes to health and nutrition, there's no exception. Deception is not just in the realm of government and public education, the legal system, things like that. Yes, those things are all based on, those essentially are, are all psychopathic institutions that are based on lies and deception. However, when it comes to health and nutrition, it's not exempt from that. Starting several decades ago, maybe even earlier, several key blatant lies were injected into popular culture. And the ones that were the most, that I think are the most important to call to attention because they have the most impact and, and they were having the most impact on me, I can say with certainty, speaking about myself, was the demonization of cholesterol, trying to link cholesterol causally to heart disease, which has never been proven ever, not even once. And someone who claims it has is lying or they don't understand. Uh, they don't understand the science. The opposite is true. Cholesterol is absolutely essential for good health in every cell of the body. And saturated fats also getting a bad rap with respect to other fats, when in fact, saturated fats are the most natural fat for the human body. And then, of course, on the flip side of that, the introduction of these so-called manufactured synthetic oils, what they call the vegetable oils, euphemistically, but we can actually call them seed oils. So I'm talking about canola, rapeseed oil, um, safflower, and so on and so forth. All these bright yellow, sunny looking oils that, that are the cheapest oils to buy. And they are just terrible for human health. And there's a number of reasons why. I'm not going to get into all the science of that. Go do research on why. The gentlemen that I mentioned earlier have some great videos where they dive into that. Um, but can you? do you see how it's all been inverted? Do you see how it's all been inverted? I mean, there was a time when heart attacks were almost unheard of in, in, the, in the public record, in the medical record. And then they all of a sudden started occurring. We as human beings had always been eating fatty meats and lots of cholesterol and we didn't, never even thought about it. And it was never an issue. There was never an issue of heart health. And if you go back and do enough research, you'll see that that's true. And if you also compare the health of people today who have been living carnivore, and there are people you can find online who have been eating carnivore for decades, not just like me who's kind of new to all this. So don't take, again, don't take my word for it. Go go talk to people who have been carnivore for several decades and see, or who are living, who are now in their 80s, 90s, or even hundreds in age, have been eating this way for their, for the most of their life and go check out their health. Get, get you know, use them as a testimonial because I don't have a long enough of a track record to really speak as authoritatively, but I've just done my research. So the demonization of cholesterol and the demonization of saturated fat and the you know evangelization 
if you will, of seed oils, among other things, as well as the high carb, low fat diets, which people remember started becoming a thing maybe in the 80s, I think it was, um, 80s and 90s, like the whole low, low fat craze where people would literally buy you know foods like yogurt like this is zero fat yogurt it's gonna be great for your health like you got to be fucking kidding so as i started getting into this i not only realized you know what was appropriate to eat but why and also what i should eliminate from my diet in addition to all the sugar and carbs so this was a huge waken awakening for me and i started to really put all the pieces together as I deepen my research and as I continue to test all of this out on myself. Cool. So we're kind of deep into all this. So I just want to take a pause for a minute to just check in with you. Obviously, this is not a live video, but we can still make it interactive. So if you're still with me here, I would invite you to comment below the video. Just any questions, any thoughts that come up so far as far as this conversation, because yeah, because like I said, I want to make this into an interaction and I, I'm definitely going to respond to any any comments and questions that come up as long as they're thoughtful, right? As long as you're not just trying to ad hominem attack my, me because you don't like what I'm saying. But I do want to respond to thoughtful questions. Even if you don't agree with me, let's make it conversational. Having said that, if we're going to talk intelligently about all of this and really understand it, Going back to sharing with you what I did about my own story earlier and how I was so addicted to sugar, we absolutely have to come to grips with the understanding of just how toxic sugar, meaning glucose, fructose, <clears throat> and even carbohydrates, which break down into sugars in the body, how toxic this all is to our physiology, even in small amounts, and how much the body goes out of its way to protect itself when our sugar when the amount of glucose or fructose in our body goes up to even a certain level because what happens is sugar not to get too much in the weeds but glucose causes has a, causes something called glycation basically glucose has a tendency to bind to proteins and fats unnecessarily meaning with no actual benefit and what, what that binding does is it tends, it disables the functionality of whatever that carbo, whatever that protein or fat is. And it's basically called glycation. So it's adding glucose to something unnecessarily. So this kind of damage can happen easily within the cells of our body. So the cells naturally lock out when, when the amount of glucose inside the cell, meaning within the, within the membrane, within the cell wall, reaches a certain level then it's just going to lock it out and it's going to keep that glucose in the bloodstream. And even though the insulin is trying to push that sugar out of the bloodstream and into the cells, which is part of what the uh, insulin is meant to do as a, as a uh, hormone, it's not going to be able to do that. And that the, the sugar is going to start to build up in the cardiovascular system. And the reason is because Damage is going to happen one way or the other. The epithelial cells of the cardiovascular system, they tend to replace themselves much more quickly. So it's kind of like we'll sacrifice this for that. You know, it's, it's easier to sacrifice some blood cells and some epithelial cells than it is to start damaging the insides of the actual functional cells of the body. So I don't want to get too much in the weeds, but the bottom line is more than even a small amount of sugar in your body is, t is highly toxic and is of zero benefit to you as a human being and can only lead to more damage and more illness. And it's unnecessary. It's unnecessary because if you were to eat zero carbo carbohydrates in your body, you would still live a long and healthy life. And the reason is because your body has the ability to manufacture the amount of carbohydrate or the amount of glucose that it needs to run, for example, the brain, the nervous system and whatever other functionality is required, it can all be done endogenously, meaning within the body without bringing in outside sources. So outside sources are always, always unnecessary 100% of the time. And like I said, even a small amount is going to be toxic. Now, when you start to rewind and you think, why was there so much of a push for 
low fat, high carb diets for increasing sugar consumption, lots of high fructose corn syrup and so forth. When you start to piece it all together and you look at how the institutions of the world are, you know, have basically been constructed by psychopaths, you can see why they would have pro promoted such an agenda and why they, they're always going to put their weight behind that kind of thinking. But from a pure physiological perspective, we've got to come to grips with the fact that really there's no reason to ever eat any sugar or any carbohydrate unless you're absolutely starving and you just could not get any other nutrition at all, which in the modern world, when, when is that actually going to happen? Now let's talk about plants, the nature of plant life, the fact that plants want to live, and kind of this whole perspective that in particular veganisms or uh, veganism or people who are vegans take kind of in opposition to this way of thinking and, and really calling on basically a morality to say, well, you're, you're, we're basically murdering these animals in order to survive. And so I want to address all this in context to plants. Let's look at a few facts that you may, again, you may or may not agree with me on this. So uh, just a reminder, I am an animist. What is, an, who, what is an animist? An animist is someone who recognizes that everything in, in nature is alive and everything is imbued with consciousness and everything has a desire, some innate desire to live and grow and evolve. So animals, just like human beings, and we are a type of animal, they obviously have their own innate desires. They're, they're, they want to survive and they will defend themselves and they will, you know, really put up a fight and or flee or do whatever they need to do to survive just like we will. Well, plants also are conscious and plants also want to live. In fact, the proof is in their defenses. Now, plants don't move like animals do. They can't run away. So how do plants defend themselves? very simply, through toxicity, through poison. Plants have many carcinogens and neurotoxins and anti-nutrients. These are things that prevent the absorption of the nutrients that they have in order to discourage them, discourage animals and human beings from eating them. Plants defend themselves. And there is essentially a an, an arms race, as it will, as it were, between plants and animals to each defend it, itself, right? And if you think about this, do you remember that movie? I think it was called Into the Wild. Do you remember what happened to the main character in that movie? And I'm not saying he, he was a bad person, but what was his demise? His demise was he went and ate the wrong plants. He consumed the wrong thing. And that plant was toxic and deadly, not just because it's an evil plant, it was toxic and deadly because it wanted to survive. It's really that simple. If you think about species, like think about a koala. Koalas pretty much eat eucalyptus, the leaves of eucalyptus, not even the entire plant, I, th I think, I'm not 100% sure, but I think it's just the leaves. And only that tree, or predominantly that. If there's no eucalyptus, they start to die off. So there are niches, or niches, if you're from, <laughs> if you speak British English. Uh, so there are niches. I actually like niches better, so I'm just going to say that. There are niches, and every, every species tends to eat within a very narrow range. I mean, cows pretty much eat grass, and that's it. Grass and the, the weeds, so-called weeds that grow among the grass. Same thing with horses. Animals don't eat, you know, different species don't tend to make a lot of variety in what they eat because they, they know, just like we do, that if they stray too far from what they eat, they could get poisoned. So this whole notion that somehow it's morally better to eat plants than animals is, I consider it completely ridiculous. Everything is alive. And so there is no moral high ground you know, we live in a universe where everything pretty much eats everything else to survive. We eat plants, although it's not optimal, we eat animals. Animals can eat us. Animals can eat other animals. Animals eat plants. Plants eat insects, and insects eat plants. I mean, look at that. We live in a universe where everything eats everything else. Now, 
could it be would it be better to live in a reality where that wasn't true maybe perhaps i would agree i mean is that optimal probably not you know could it could another reality exist or does another universe exist where things don't have to eat each other perhaps it's very likely that th that there is and th and that probably would be a great thing but to come and say that you know we're going to deny our physiology as human beings the way we are un until and unless we can alter our genetics which i would agree may be possible with enough of an advanced science but to come and deny our very physiology and claim moral high ground when the plants that we eat also are defending themselves and also have a desire to live to me it's just it's all nonsense it's all intellectual posturing and it's not very well thought through if you don't agree with that you know i challenge you to just go in the woods and just start eating random plants and see what happens to you see what happens to your physiology when you do that and if you think about it the seeds are the most protected you could die from eating too many almonds you can die if you eat too many almonds all at once and the reason is because they contain cyanide which is in enough of a quantity is a deadly poison to you and I and to even to the animals to, to anyone now most of the time I agree we won't eat more than maybe a small number of almonds when we do I don't eat almonds anymore but that's why they taste so terrible and to my opinion I never liked the taste of almonds honestly I could never wrap my head around why people wanted to eat them I understand that sometimes people would add them as a garnish to certain foods but I just it's the seed of a plant it's the baby how much would you, do you think the parents of a human child how far do you think they go to defend the life of their child what do you think they would do if they were forced into a position where they had to defend their child's life so plants are the same way it's just that you know because they don't move that doesn't mean they don't have life they're not imbued with life and they don't want it to propagate themselves they defend themselves through toxicity. There's also a reason why we cannot digest cellulose or fiber. It's indigestible for us. Now, some animals can. Cows have a very different digestive system than we do. So it is appropriate for a cow or for other animals who have that capacity to consume these plants because their physiology takes that into account. Ours does not. I just wanted to mention all that because I because a lot of the arguments for veganism and for plant-based living base themselves on kind of this morality that somehow it's wrong to eat animals to kill animals to eat them but it's right to kill plants and eat them and I think that's that notion is completely ridiculous it's nonsense and it's incorrect all right let's talk about fruits frugivores fruitarians and fruit loops as I like to call them <laughs> and I swear some of these YouTubers or people that I see online who claim, you know, claim to or may have actually eaten only fruit for a long time. I mean, to me, they're mentally deranged. That's just how I look at it. But one could say, you know, one could put up an argument. Well, David, I get it about not eating, for example, the broccoli or the leaves and the plants because they are toxic, the seeds. But what about these delicious, wonderful fruits that nature has given us? The beautiful, delicious mango the pineapple, the banana, the grapes, the raspberries. So a couple of things. First of all, I completely agree. These things are delicious. They're tasty. At the very least, we have to be, if we're being honest with each other, they taste good. Why? Because again, they're sweet. Why is there such this strong affinity to things that are sweet? I'm not 100% sure, but if I had to guess, it was an adaptive mechanism so that when our proper diet was scarce in moments of scarcity we would be attracted to and have a desire to eat those fruits because it would give us that little boost of energy that we would need to survive in those circumstances the other thing might be the other reason is there's a reason why fruits usually impact seeds of these plants because that's a mechanism for certain animals and there's usually a very specific animal that's meant to eat each fruit will come in to eat that fruit and then those seeds will pass through the digestion of that animal they won't be digested 
they'll be and they'll and then through the poop through the feces of the animal they'll be fertilized and then the plant basically the plant that's how the plant basically propagates itself through its seeds through the fruit so yes those fruits are perhaps meant to be eaten maybe not always maybe it's just meant to hold and and uh nourish the seed until it has such time to grab root in the earth but yeah i mean i agree these things taste great but again let's go back to the basics the two things that we talked about number one fruit a fruit only diet is completely destitute of nutrition from a human perspective factually and you cannot get proper human nutrition just from eating fruit I think there was even a recent, I don't remember her name, but there was a recent well-known fruitarian, a young woman, not, not very old, younger than me, and she died. And it was a big deal on social media. And of course, all the vegans and fruitarians, you know, rallied around her or, or basically uh, apologized for her death, saying that she did something wrong as a fruitarian. Well, yeah, she did do something wrong. She believed that a fruitarian diet is, is appropriate for human nutrition. That's what she did wrong. And then that opened the door for other diseases that otherwise her body would have been able to mitigate or eliminate to basically take over her body. And again, I don't remember the specifics. Um, but all of the fruitarians that I've seen on, on videos, they all look malnourished to me. And some of them look absolutely mentally crazy, like there's something wrong with them mentally because they're not getting proper nutrition. So that's the first thing. And then recall what we said about fructose and sugar in general. F yes, fructose is also to highly toxic, not just glucose. Fructose is highly toxic, even in small quantities in the human organism. There is no place for more than a very tiny amount of fructose in the body. In fact, really there shouldn't be any. And I'm going to turn on the AC here because it's gotten really hot. So hopefully that's not going to make too much noise for you all. But I just, I'm going to do that. Just wanted to let you know. So, so no, we are not meant to be fruitarians. Can we get away with an occasional indulgence? Sure, I do that. I'll admit that. I'll talk more about, you know, how much carbohydrate I generally eat per week in a little bit. But... I, I agree, a, good, a delicious mango, a mango is delicious. I mean, who's gonna deny that? It has a very interesting and sweet and succulent flavor and and it looks beautiful and all those things. So I'm not, I'm not gonna deny any of that, but it's not, this is not a mainstay of, or even a requirement of human nutrition at all in nature. So now I'm gonna wrap up this part where I'm kind of explaining to you all the science at a high level of what I've learned about the science of human nutrition and our physiology. And I'm going to start to transition now into all the amazing benefits that I have received so far in this one year of carnivore. And also some of the mistakes that I've made, because I have made mistakes along the way too. And I, you know, as I've transitioned into, into this lifestyle, then uh, that of course you know we're not going to get, always get it right so i'm going to i'm going to admit to you some of the mistakes that i've made so that you can avoid that if you if you should choose to go to embrace this path so just to kind of sum it all up go check out the research of these fine fellows and others that i've mentioned there are many others who i didn't mention lady men and women ladies and gentlemen who have done great and excellent research and study and testing to prove it all out both from a historical perspective, but also from a pure physiology perspective. So go check it all out and see what you can glean from it. But I think the number one headline that I wanted to kind of lead with, to kind of wrap that up is to remind you that not only can you live your entire life without eating a single carbohydrate ever, ever, but when you do that, you're actually optimizing your health and nutrition. To the best of what I've seen, it's completely unnecessary. It's completely unnecessary. It's just an elect. It's just an election. It's a choice. It's an option. It's an indulgence, and hopefully a small indulgence. So having said that, now I'm going to start to share with you what I have learned about myself from all this, and kind of all the different physiological changes and benefits that I've started to gain from switching over to a carnivore diet. 
So the transformation that I've experienced in my health has been nothing less than amazing, spectacular. I am so grateful for having figured this out and I'm so grateful for what I've been able to figure out so far and what I've experienced so far in this approximately one year of being pretty much dedicated to eating carnivore and to reducing my carbohydrate intake to as close to zero as possible. The top two benefits that I have gained, which are somewhat interconnected because they can affect each other, the number one benefit is a dramatic reduction in my chronic inflammation, specifically around the area that I told you about, the tight, the tight area in my back due to the congenital issue that I have, but also just in general in terms of my overall physiology. The, the reduction in inflammation is astounding. And even for example, when I do exercise and fitness, Whereas in the past, I would get a lot of soreness and it would make, I would have to pause and take a break even a day or two before continuing. Even that doesn't happen anymore. I can pretty much, you know, keep going until my muscles fatigue and I never really experience that muscle soreness. But sleeping better at night is just the number one benefit. It's, it's, it's the one that's been the game changer for me because when I think back, even when I was a young kid, what was making me crazy, what was making me kind of start to go insane more than anything else was the, la was the chronic poor sleep, the chronic lack of good sleep. And then when I was drugging myself, for example, with the clonazepam, it was a false sleep. So yes, I was sleeping longer, but it wasn't a true deep nourishing sleep. And it was just a dulling of the mind. So two extremes. Now I'm able to get refreshing and lively sleep where I am able to dream and even get involved in my dreams. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but where I also wake up fully refreshed and ready to face the day and not feeling any kind of fatigue or ickiness or being held back or tiredness or lethargy or any of that. This has been a game changer. I mean, I cannot speak... I can't, it's hard for me to express just how grateful I am for this change. This alone has, has pretty much made it worth it. Even with the inflammation greatly reduced, but maybe not zero again, because perhaps because of the congenital issues and, and, and you know, the bone structure therein, it's already a thousand times better than it used to be. So that alone has made a huge difference. And, and I've, as I'm eating this way, I've literally felt my body thanking me. I've literally felt my body, it's almost as though if my body could speak, it would say, thank you, David, thank you. Thank you very much, I really appreciate that. I mean, it's so incredible to have that renewed relationship with my body, which is not, a, not separate from me. My, you know, I and my body are the same, we are just different aspects of the same consciousness, but it's kind of like the reintegration of the whole me and that gratitude for taking better care of me. It's impossible to overstate that. It's, it's impossible to overstate that. So I just wanted to express that the best that I can in words, knowing that even words are hard. It's hard to express fully in words. In context to sleep, I wanted to mention kind of an additional benefit related to that that's unlocked for me massively, even over the past month or two, even more than I would say even in the past year, that I'm probably going to talk more about at length on another video because it is a whole topic into itself but I wanted to at least mention it here and that is having this amazing vivid completely conscious and lucid extreme experience the likes of which I've never had at any point in my life so I'm talking about basically on-demand lucid dreaming where and this just happened last night by the way so this is not something that's just very rare I mean this is happening to me more and more frequently. In fact, in the, in the past month, I've had more of these vivid, fully awakened lucid dream experiences where I'm deeply involved in the dream. I've had more of them in the last 30 days than I had in the last year. And I've had more of these in the last year than I had in the, la in the previous 10 years or maybe even in my entire life, certainly since I was a young child. And I attribute that in part to the healing of 
the mind, the brain specifically, specifically the pineal gland and all the different mechanisms that allow our physiology to interface with consciousness and with the dream world. And it's just been utterly incredible. I mean, it's the, the ability to interact with the dream world almost on the same level and of, of clarity and lucidity as the, as the waking world or the so-called waking world is unparalleled. And it opens up so many possibilities for personal exploration, personal development, putting to practice life skills, putting to practice interacting with others. I mean, there's endless, and not just to mention the just the sheer fun and pleasure. And I can tell you what I've noticed about the dream world is it's so vivid, so colorful, with, a, with some really cool creatures. I mean, you have these creatures that are like cats, but they don't act exactly like cats. And they, they actually change, they change shapes, but they still like to cuddle. And, you know, people with their own desires and, and you can have amazing conversations. And, you know, people, the, the characters in your dream, they'll surprise you because you never know what they're going to do or say. But you can kind of predict what they're going to do and say because as you get to know them, you kind of suss out their personality but they can still take you by surprise and some of them are going to try to hurt you, but you know, you, you defend yourself. And it's just, I mean, again, this is a topic that I could go in so deeply, but just a gratitude that I'm able to get into that dream world. And I, sometimes I love to just like touch the surfaces in the dream world and just like, wow, like the, the, the level of detail is incredible. I mean, just in awe of it and in awe of the fact that I can appreciate it in the moment. And also one thing I've noticed is people talk about like when you go into the dream state, you have to go through the sleep paralysis and it feels awkward. I, that never happens to me. For me, it's just like, it's like in Star Trek. It's like, I'm there. I'm out of it. And I can go back and forth. Like last night I, I went into the dream and for whatever reason I woke up and then I said, oh, I want to go back into it. And I went back and I popped right back, like literally instantaneously popped right back into the same place I was with no delay. So I know people talk about like how hard it is to get into the dream state. But I think when our health is optimal and when our body is fully relaxed, then you can just pop in and out of that state. So anyway, I'm going to leave it at that because if I get into that topic too much, it's going to turn it. It's going to make this video too long. But suffice it to say, that's been another amazing benefit that I've experienced. And, uh, you know, in terms of unlocking basically what I would call dream time and interacting with the dream world. Another amazing benefit is unlocking youth and feeling young and kind of that unlimited energy despite my physiological age. So I'm 53 years old and I don't even feel my age. Like, I feel younger than I have in many respects for many years. And again, my health is not 100% perfect. I still have to deal with my congenital issue. I still have to deal with some inflammation occasionally. And I still have to be mindful, of course, of my health to optimize it. But I can tell you, I feel so much younger. And this part is a little bit sad. You know, when I walk around, so right now as I'm recording this, I'm in El Salvador. and. Um, I'm just going to be super straight with you. The way that people eat, the, the typical diet here in El Salvador is atrocious. It is atrocious. It is it, it, it does not resemble a proper human diet in any way, shape, or form. It, it represents the inverse of a proper human diet. It is, it's a terrible diet. And it shows. And I run into people who are younger than me, or my age, or maybe even a little bit older, and they're falling apart. And the, peop and the saddest thing for me is, is looking at people who, who are younger than me and they look older, and they, but it's the look on their face. It's the suffering. I can see the suffering in their eyes and on their face. And it's just like, it's so unnecessary. It's like they're, they're depressed. It's like they're, they've been beaten down. And, and me, again, I'm not saying it's perfect, but I wake up and I'm like, yes, I can do this. I, I have all the faculties I need to face my day. I have what it takes. I have what it takes to, to, to keep improving and keep getting better and, and, and keep growing in life. And that's the most important thing. And I don't even think about my age. I don't think, I don't worry about it. I don't think about, you know, how, 
how old I am versus you know how much life I have left. It doesn't. None of that occurs to me. I don't feel any aspect of aging anymore. I feel confident. I feel like every time I go to do exercise, there's no limit. It's just it, the limit is only what I set in my own mind, like what I choose to do. So it is essentially tapping into a fountain of youth. Now, just eating alone is not enough to reverse aging, as I'm going to share it in a little bit, but it has been a big part of unlocking that. And I'm just like the thought of taking medication to me is just preposterous. It doesn't even occur to me. Maybe on a very rare occasion, if I actually physically injure myself and I need to take one pain reliever to temporarily relieve that acute pain, sure, I mean, that can happen to anyone. But I'm talking about just like day to day, like the, the notion of having to deal with, even have to worry about that is preposterous, right? Beyond the normal things that we want to do to optimize our health. Now, having said all that, I did make a couple mistakes getting into the carnivore diet, which I then quickly corrected and also did more research to understand properly how to do all this. So the biggest mistake I made, the two biggest mistakes I think more than anything else was trying to shift my diet too quickly without enough of a transition. And that was an issue both in terms of psychology, like faking myself out, in other words, becoming worried just becoming worried that I was going to hurt myself by doing that. But also, physiologically, when we shift over, it's it's a shock to the mechanism, to the organism, because your body is going to be used to eating a certain way. So we need to respect the body memory and, and ease into these things. And from a physiological perspective also, when you're not used to eating carnivore, then the one thing that can suffer more than anything else is electrolytes. So we have to be really mindful of making sure that we have our electrolytes in balance. Um, and you can feel, if you don't take proper care of that, as I did some in certain points, you can feel, you'll start to feel off. Like you, your body will tell you that you're missing key electrolytes. So it's really important to take that into account. I have made it a habit to occasionally, uh, first of all, I try to season my food with only Himalayan salt, Himalayan pink salt. And sometimes I'll even put a little bit of Himalayan pink salt into water and drink it as a way to rehydrate myself. So it is important to pay attention to electrolytes. And that, you know, if there was one area where supplementation, at least in the interim, could help as you fully transition, that's probably the one place where it does make sense to either supplement or just be very mindful of your electrolytes. But other than that, once I was able to ease more into it and be mindful of that, there really were no other issues where I got tripped up. And I know some people will say, well, don't you get bored, David? No, I don't. You know what? You want to know why? I mean, sure. Occasionally, I, of course, we're, I'm, I'm going to miss, you know, tasting something sweet every once in a while or, you know, I'm going to want to make a little bit of variety and not just eat the same thing all the time. But the main reason I don't is because I'm always feeling so great. And so that feeling good, that abundant energy basically fuels itself. You know, it, it, it it's basically its own source of reward. And I'm never hungry. I mean, I usually eat only once or twice a day. You probably heard of OMAD, one meal a day. So I, for, I kind of eat that way. I, I almost never eat breakfast. And I'm usually eating within a three to five hour window later in the day and that's that's it and then and i'm i'm usually done not even eating because i'm starving i'm never starving anymore this is another huge benefit it's almost like it's hard to explain it's almost like it comes into your mind like it might be a good idea to eat now or now is usually when you eat david you might want to consider eating now so there is a little bit of change in the energy a little bit of a a, a hunger signal but it's not this like oh my God, I've got to eat something. I'm absolutely starving. I can't even think straight. My blood sugar is tanking. None of that. That does not happen anymore. I can't even remember the last time that that happened. The level of energy is so much more even. It's more like a, you know, whereas before it was like a spiking up and down. Now it's like steady going down, steady going down, steady going down, steady going down, even leveling off. And then, okay, 
upward tick as I eat something and then less straight straight leveling down leveling down that's the best way I can explain it is not it's not these huge troughs peaks and troughs that I used to experience I mean I literally would go crazy in the past if I didn't eat within like six hours I, I thought the, the world was coming to an end because of the hunger and that's all gone like you know I've talked about fasting which I still practice on other videos and I could easily go several days without eating. I mean, it would be uncomfortable, but it's not like the, the world is coming apart. So these are just some of the additional benefits that I've experienced as well. Okay. So I've been recording for a while now and I don't want, to, I didn't want to make this video too long, but I also wanted to just share everything and not, you know, not hold back in terms of sharing these things. So we're coming to the wrap to wrap up now. And I'll just mention in context a couple of other things. The first thing I'll mention is changing the way I eat was not, is not and was not the only way that I've been helping myself to heal and maintain optimal nutrition. I have used fasting, which I have talked about again on other videos and will talk about, specifically dry fasting. I'm not going to get into that on this video because I want to keep the topic tight, but I promise that I will talk more about that. So I have used fasting, particularly intermittent dry fasting. So not eating or drinking in between meals has been a huge benefit. I've also used grounding, grounding or earthing, putting my bare feet on the earth in order to replenish electrons and balance out the electro electrochemical properties of the body. And also just to receive information and nourishment from the planet. So this has also been huge and is very important. It's not just the way I eat. So those two, I have some other things as well, but I'm going to kind of leave it at that and we can explore those topics together on another video. The only, the last thing I'll mention is that the goal of eating carnivore, and this was ancestrally appropriate as well, is to reduce the amount of carbohydrates to as close to zero as possible. I am eating typically between 50 and 100 grams of carbohydrates a week. Between 50 and 100 a week. So I think that works out to about, what is that, about seven to 12 a day. I mean, I'm not eating carbohydrates every day, but if we were to average it out, it would be less than 15 carbohydrates a day. So we're talking really, really a very small amount. Every once in a while, I might indulge in something that I would normally not eat. And I've allowed myself to do that because I have reached a point where I am able to, through willpower, control my urges and not fall back into binging. But I also space it out so that I don't set myself up for failure. So I leave the door open for an occasional indulgence because I think in life that's perfectly fine. We can occasionally eat something that it's not, we're not really supposed to eat that, but we're not going to die. We're not going to kill ourselves if we eat it every once in a while. I think that's important to have some level of balance and not go to an extreme and say, oh, I'm never, ever going to eat another piece of fruit or another candy or another cake or another that ever, 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 ever again in my life. Never, ever, ever. I think that kind of polarized thinking just sets you up for failure. Just like when I quit smoking cigarettes, every once in a while, after, after I had quit for about five years and didn't touch a single cigarette for five years. After that, maybe a couple of times a year, I would have a cigarette or a tobacco product. But the, the desire was so, had been so removed that honestly, I don't even really think about it and, and I don't even desire it. And if I never had one again, I probably wouldn't care. But I wanted to create a healthy relationship with these things where if I decided to indulge in something every once in a while, it wouldn't be the end of the world. That's also important in context is, is to go to extremes sometimes it's not good. And there's a reason why our bodies can digest carbohydrates, even though we really don't need them. We don't need to consume them externally. I should say we don't need them exo exogenously. We do need them inside our body, but our body can manufacture them. We don't need to eat them. I just wanted to share all that because it is ultimately about creating balance, creating something that's gonna work for you. What I have shared with you works really well for me has worked really well up to this point and I will continue to optimize that. But for no other reason that I want you to suffer less and I want you to experience 
in all these benefits and more in your own life and to overcome whatever health challenges you've been facing, specifically you, then that has been my motivation for sharing this with you. So I hope this has been super valuable. If it has, show some love on this video. Give this, smash the heck out of that beautiful and gorgeous like button. And also I want you to hit that beautiful subscribe button if you haven't already. Become a subscriber to this channel and leave a comment below, anything at all. You know, Share with me what's the number one thing that you got out of this video. I'd love to hear from you about that. Let's make it more of a conversation. If you ever wanna reach out to me, just shoot me an email david at freedomvibe.art or you can find links to all my social media below the video as well so as always it's been my pleasure to spend this time with you and to share this important knowledge with you and share my experiences and i will see you very soon take care